All right, everybody. Welcome back to the best hour of their day. Fern here again. I'm here with my good friend, Mr. Matt Miller. And I'm kind of excited about this talk. Uh, this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart just due to uh, my family, quite frankly. But I do have a little beef with Matt. He is an Alabama fan. I'm an LSU fan. And next weekend, it's on. So uh, I'll be honest with you, I never like playing the Tide at their home. But it is what it is, man. It is what it is. It's what it is. I'm uh, hoping to make a comeback. Yeah, he's not. He's not doing well. I mean, he's a great quarterback, but he's he's in the middle of a little bit of an injury. So I'm hoping that's going to work out to our advantage, and I'll take it. I don't care. <laughs> I hear you have a hot trophy front runner, don't you? Uh, if he's not the Heisman Trophy frontrunner, I don't know who is, to be frank with you, because he's been crushing it. I mean, Auburn was his worst game, and it wasn't a bad game. It just wasn't a ridiculous game like he's been having every weekend. So, yeah, I'm a Joe Burrow fan. When Joe Burrow can run for touchdowns against that defense, you guys have a great team. I mean, listen, we could go on and on about, like, the frustration I've had with the lack of good QBs at LSU for the past two decades, but we'll, I'll, we'll refrain that for another podcast. Um, but anyway, so uh, in the spirit of trying to provide value to the community, um, Matt and I are going to talk about some topics that are probably not necessarily on the top of people's minds, but um, Matt's background is in the mental health um, field, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. But Matt's got some other cool stuff going on. He and I have crossed paths at the games uh, and some other networks, and uh, and then somebody like uh, hit me up um, again a couple weeks ago and said you should get Matt on the show. So we set it up. Here we are. Uh, but he's working on. He's got some CEUs that available that are available for you guys that are trying to keep your credentials good for level three, and uh, and we're going to dive into some stuff, but. The, the big topic that we're going to kind of dive into once we get there is, you know, it, with the shift to health, right? You know, the, the idea here is that we're trying to, we're trying to uh, work with the underserved, which is essentially what Coach Glassman has defined as the elderly and the obese. You know, there are some, some pretty significant hurdles there with regard to uh, the psychological um, space that a lot of people are in you know you have to learn really how to manage objections uh from a coaching standpoint so i think the mental health space um has a lot to offer here uh and my mom has been um uh, you know a clinical and and private practice social worker for like almost 40 years you know dealing with a lot of scenarios so uh, I'm, I'm pretty intimately familiar with with a lot of these things and uh it's a big deal so matt i appreciate you coming on the show man thank you you're welcome. Thank you so much for having me on the show and giving me this access to this awesome community that's made the impact on me and my family. I didn't know this about your mom. Yeah. Yeah. She's, um, my mom, she's been doing it. Uh, I mean, primarily she's been, I guess the bulk of her, of her case work is probably, uh, a lot of marriage counseling, but she, over the years that's kind of fluctuated and she does, she did a lot of, um, post-traumatic stress counseling after Katrina because they're down there in Baton Rouge and you know she saw tons and tons of people for years after that so yeah she's um you know she's been doing this for a long time and I've picked up some things from her over the years obviously because uh, she's really good at it but this is uh this is a skill set that probably most coaches are not what I would say like well equipped for right or with if you will uh, is to have some of those hard conversations and um, because they can be a little awkward. Like I don't really know how to say that. And they can be a little like super stressful for both parties. If you don't know how to navigate that, those waters. Absolutely. You know, the next that EU event for CrossFit coaches, thank goodness, you know, headquarters approved it um, is called the art and science of uncomfortable conversations. And, um, Definitely awkward, uncomfortable, uh, necessary. Mm -hmm. The so uh, let's talk about the CEUs there real quick. So uh, the the title. If so, if anybody's trying to get CEUs for their uh, for their continuing education for their um, for their level three, the title of the course is or is the art and science of uncomfortable um, conversation. So talk to me a little bit about the course first, and then we're going to talk about some more practical things that like coaches can do, 
Um, like if, you know, what my goal with you today is to like, if somebody listens to this podcast and then somebody that falls into that demographic walks in the door immediately is that they would be at least better equipped to have the conversation than, than before they listen to the podcast. Absolutely. Uh, definitely the purpose for me having the CU event and stick my head out of what's really not professional uh, swim lane, as you would say, um, is to to first and foremost share a strategy, a technique, a tactic, call it what you will, a process. It's really, as Dr. William Miller would say, the guy that kind of created something we call motivational interviewing. Mm -hmm. It was really the way of being with how to just really exist in, in time and place with someone. And Carl Rogers probably had the biggest influence, Dr. Carl Rogers, the great pioneer in counseling techniques, would say that um, being able to exhibit accurate empathy with people usually uh, has the biggest impact on outcomes of counseling sessions, right? So if we take that skill set, let's say knowing how to have an uncomfortable, awkward conversation with someone 30 minutes before you start briefing as a CrossFit coach, let's say, knowing how to appropriately and effectively be with that person, um, I think it's, it's only going to enhance our ability as CrossFit coaches and affiliates and also participants, athletes, you know, clients, whatever we call ourselves, members of the community to be able to sit and be with folks. But definitely for coaches, this acronym ORS is really the way that we stay on task with this particular strategy. Um, to exhibit accurate empathy requires, we know by studying counseling sessions, by literally videotaping and then critiquing the styles of counseling, um, that people who exhibit accurate empathy by asking open-ended questions. So instead of being directive, it really comes across as non-directive. In essence, it's not my agenda, it's your agenda. Yeah. Right? And so, you know, we've heard this for years, be where the client is, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're not ready to do a ring muscle up, do you need to be training them on a ring muscle up? Well, from a coaching standpoint, no. <laughs> we should probably start with a progression of some sort uh, and maybe, and again, meeting them where they're at. Uh, but, and so, so Jay and I did an, uh, an, uh, an episode on empathy a while back and it, it actually got quite a bit of feedback on that. Like one of the, probably one of the most listened to episodes that we've done. So if you haven't listened to that, go back and listen to it, everybody. But what, and we talked about a lot of different things, you know, we talked about tonality, body language, facial expressions, you know, like how you engage people, but what would you describe as accurate empathy? And I asked that because empathy can be this big, vague thing where it's just like, Hey, have more empathy, which, you know, which we would describe as just care more, but that's, I don't know that does it justice. Like, what does that look like in real time? I'm going to be a little bit more nerdy here. And, no, that's great. Uh, I think it's necessary. And this will be part of the class too. And, and I can say that when we're really, when we're talking about using ORs or something we call motivational interviewing, when we're being with someone so we can have accurate empathy, we're also juggling another kind of theory in the field of behavioral science, really in change psychology the psychology of change and that is something we call the trans theoretical model of change all right some people call it the stages of change it may mm -hmm. even be called readiness to change so are you familiar with the stages um i if you told them to me i could probably like or if you start i could probably piecemeal them together but the short answer is no i'm sure i've yeah. seen them at some point but haven't but I, the the um the author I have that book in, I might have it here, but motivational interviewing. Who's the author for that again, for people who are interested in that? I forgot. I'm 
almost positive that if it is uh, really motivational interviewing, um, it's going to be Howard, not Howard, William Miller. Howard Miller is the owner of CrossFit Huntsville, my affiliate. Yeah. William Miller from the University of New Mexico. Okay. And there's another good one that's very similar to that book, which is called Coactive Coaching. Uh, so people can check that out too. But I, I do have that book. I don't know if it's here. It might be at my house. But I do have um, motivational interviewing in my possession. Man, that stuff is so powerful. And motivational interviewing really is just another way of um, using a Rogerian approach in counseling sessions. But we know that as they've kind of studied and tested this approach on other populations, let's say, and uh, not just like the original research that Dr. Miller did for motivational interviewing was with problem drinkers. All right. And so then he found that there was a usefulness in uh, smoke cessation or helping people quit smoking. And this is where um, this other theory that we're also juggling while we're using ORs, let's say, asking open-ended questions, using affirmations, reflective listening, and summarizing, we're also juggling and keeping really at the forefront of our mind that every person we meet is somewhere along these stages of change. Every single one of us are somewhere on one of these stages. The first stage that we talk about is called pre-contemplation, all right? And so a person with a pre-contemplative mindset, um, we say they're not ready. That's a good way to describe it. They literally don't think they have a problem, mm -hmm. all right? So how you talk to someone, how you are able to be with someone, how you use or with someone who's not ready, um, you know, that's, that's really potent. How you talk to someone who is ready, we would call that person either in preparation, the stage of preparation or the stage of action. You wouldn't talk to them the same way you talk to somebody who's in pre-contemplation, but most service organizations, whether you're an alcohol and drug rehab center, whether you are a fitness center, a CrossFit affiliate, in my opinion, um, these organizations are what we would call action-oriented type of facilities or organizations. We're already assuming that you're ready. When you walk through the door, we've got rigs bolted in the concrete. We're ready. Mm -hmm. All right. And we're assuming if you come in here and you go through the one-on-one -on -one or the onboarding class, you're ready. So being able to understand those nuances, I think, I think, I mean, you did my L1. You guys are in touch with scaling. Now we scale movement. We scale. We understand these points of performance and learn how to scale. Scaling how you talk to someone is really what this is about for me. That is a skill that I, I, I just truth be told, have never practiced, uh, like, I guess intentionally, but it, it is something that I'm, um, particularly in the level one setting, because you meet, you interact with so many strangers, we'll call it throughout the year that, um, you do pick it up over time. You do you do subtly understand the art of uh, the tone of the way you say things or literally the order of words that you use and things like that can be the difference between this person acknowledging and accepting what you have to say or checking out for the rest of the weekend. Right. And it's a, it's an, I don't, and I have, I know nothing about it other than I've probably developed some sort of skill set with regard to that over the years, purely out of necessity because I have to connect with people in over the weekend. And I'm, and I'm thinking about the affiliate setting. So, you know, like let's go to these people who are in pre pre contemplation. So, you know, it's a, if you think about the, the number of people that come into the CrossFit gym, most of them are, it's a done deal. Like that sale is done before they actually show up. Those are not the hard ones. The, the ones that are far more difficult are uh, like if you're running six week challenges at your gym or you're doing some sort of special where you're bringing in people who are kind of on the fence, they come in and like, I'm envisioning like a very like 
specific <laughs> subset of people, which is probably a little bit overweight. Mm-hmm. Um, we have, we ask them about their fitness. They're not, they're not really understanding that they're unhealthy. And if you ask them anything about their nutrition, they're, they're, they're in their mind, their nutrition is pretty good, you know, and full disclosure, I have, I have really run into some road bumps in some of those conversations because I have no idea how to break through on some people like that. So for a coach who's dealing with that person sitting in front of them, who's, you know, let's call it 80 pounds overweight. And they're telling you that they know how to eat and you're in the midst of that conversation with your brain exploding. Like how, like, how do you start to unpack that to have a, a, a productive conversation? This is like the perfect, like, this is like, underhand softball toss i love it this well listen man i do this a ton and so i know i know how to i know how to tee these up <laughs> I love it. so here's what we're doing um the first thing is we begin with the end in mind thank you stephen covey and yep. we're going to remember the purpose for us doing what we're doing and so it's not checking a box off it's and here's another thing, and I say this to you in a loving and caring way because that's what you do, right? Hey, everybody, I'm about to get some feedback on the podcast, so just take notes. <laughs> Seriously, I say somebody that, that really is paying attention and really cares about you as a coach, like I saw you on Instagram yesterday doing like a performance evaluation or something. Mm-hmm. Is that what yesterday? Uh, and, yeah, it was a couple of days ago on the, on the best hour of their day, Instagram handle. Correct. Oh, so awesome. So you're sitting there and you're kind of talking to us about what you're looking for in the coach and all of this, having somebody in your organization at your gym, at your affiliate who understands kind of what's going on. If they would say to you, Hey, no client is hard or they're all hard, but to differentiate a pre-contemplated person well when you say hard what do you what do you mean by that like um yeah. if if i were to say man you know those conversations are harder or dealing oh, with oh got it yeah so if we could immediately start working on our own psychology uh but what i'm going to say is this ors acronym is there for when we are kind of raw and frazzled and we've had a ton of of emotional conversations. Maybe we've done too many groups that day, too many uh, sessions. Um, and it happens, you know, we're talking about real life here, running the gym, you're doing everything. And um, what I'm gonna say is, is I meet a person who's 80 pounds overweight. Um, I, I don't know what their perception is of overweight. Mm-hmm. And so, the only way I'm going to know is to ask them. And so am I going to ask them, what's your perception of obesity? Um, I don't know. Do you think that that's even appropriate, but finding out what their perception is. Look, I had a guy bring his wife in here. You know, I'm a, I'm a psychotherapist. I'm a top therapist. That's what I do. uh, You know, every hour on the hour for a living. Mm -hmm. I'm in private practice here. And so I had a guy come in uh, with his wife and, you know, he's trying to quit smoking. She scheduled the appointment. All right. So they're in there, they're in here. And, um, over the months, you know, he's just not changed. We get into all kinds of other conversations, distracted away from the end thing which was the guy needs to quit smoking the doctors are telling him it's going to kill himself it's already looking bad biologically physically for him when he goes for his checkup eventually their dog died they don't have any kids their dog dies what do you think the dog died from probably secondary smoke inhalation secondary smoke the dog died lung cancer the wife what do you think she did as a response? Well, she probably went high and right. And I would say worst case scenario decided she was going to leave him or she schedules this appointment with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, she definitely did that, but she cried. She cried. Uh, you know what he did? He went and bought another dog. 
what is your perception, right? What is your perception of your issues? So the way that we find that out is by asking open-ended questions, not yes or no questions. We mm -hmm. know this addiction trick. When you ask open-ended questions of a person, they immediately get defensive. Yeah. So uh, like an open-ended question, I'm trying to think of different tactics I've used over the years would be like, I've asked people uh, something like, you know, on a scale of one to 10, right? This is not necessarily open-ended, but it gives them a, an opportunity to kind of uh, like, how would you rate your health on whatever scale you feel necessary? And, and I, and generally that gives me a pretty good idea of it, is their perception accurate or not? And allows me to frame the conversation a little bit more. If they come in and they say, I'm, I'm on the verge of dying based on the, on these behaviors, then I'm like, okay, cool. We're there. But if they're like, eh, I'm, I'm doing okay. That, now I know I'm in for a, a far longer, rougher road in order to get this person to, to look like anything that looks like coming around. Absolutely. So definitely being creative with the tops of open-ended questions. Like you said, you eventually find out, you know, what kind of works best. And it may just be the fact that you deliver it better as time goes on. But open-ended questions are a really powerful way to find out, you know, or to find your way into accurate empathy with people. And it doesn't have to be a really long conversation. The better we get at this thing, all right? So, you know, I've, I've talked to a couple of gyms around here who have hired me for like business-related, you know, coaching stuff. Mm -hmm. And and when we're talking with the coaches and we bring this up, I've kind of tested this out before I took the chance and send in the application to CrossFit headquarters. I tested it out with them. And one of the first responses was, how are we going to have time to have these conversations? And so I think there's, again, before we even start this, we need to know as a culture inside of your affiliate, are you guys more concerned about having back-to-back -back classes or is there cushion in between? Now you guys talk, do an amazing job. I've learned so much about CrossFit, um, you know, affiliate ownership and how to be a better coach and all that from your uh, podcast. And I can't thank you guys enough for putting out so much content, but you know what that's like some people are trying to rush to the next class who is talking to the pre-contemplated person who still can't get a pull up but yeah. they're still overweight and do they think that you care well i think i'm, I'm very hesitant to ever buy off on the i don't have time uh excuse uh i you know you could always go back with a, just rephrase it as it's not a priority thing right like um they, in very few scenarios of people that I've met, and I've met, I've, I know people that are far busier than any gym owner, like any gym owner. And it's, it's usually a lack of organization, right? So let, let's just use that gym owner who is coaching back to back to back classes. Well, I mean, you can, you have, if you're the owner, you have the ability to set your schedule however you want. So my recommendation is don't set consults. If you go, if you teach the three, four, five, don't schedule a consult for five fifteen you know, at least give yourself some time to come down off of that, maybe find it. And the other thing that we do is in order to kind of wrap our brains around it is we get a, at least a little bit of information on these people before they come in. So I kind of know what they're looking for. Uh, some people are super open about it. Some people are not, but I can start to frame a little bit of what I, what needs to happen in the conversation at that point and prepare myself for this person is super scared or they're, have lost 80 pounds and they want to lose another 80 pounds. And now I'm like, okay, this is a substantial um, journey that we're on here. And um, so that's just stuff there that we've done, but you can work around that. But what would be an example for you? If you had somebody who's coming in and who's primarily coming to you and they say, Hey, I want to lose weight. Like what would open ended question for somebody like that? I like to start um, especially if I'm not, if I don't have a lot of rapport with the person, if they're new or I just haven't, you know, coached them or done a counseling session with them yet. This or acronym is 
it looks like and some of our folks who are list makers and rule followers might think you have to follow it in a linear path left right mm -hmm. what i believe open-ended questions are, are a way of eliciting out of people yeah how they're thinking about stuff but i want to tell you that a stands for affirmations yep i'm going to brag on folks uh if you've ever met dennis barry my first uh head uh, crossfit coach here at crossfit huntsville back in the day when i first started dennis barry was yelling my name when i stepped my first foot landed outside of my car when i would pull up and get out of my car i could hear him yelling my name inside of the box mm -hmm. the guy had energy and right off the bat i'm feeling good about showing up it's as if he is recognizing me just showing up yep bragging on folks for stuff that you think, hey, you're supposed to do that, you should be doing that. That mindset won't work with people who are caught in free contemplation or ambivalent about being there. Well, that's, that is something that uh, a lot of newer coaches in general, and again, like I, I'm not saying I'm naturally gifted at this, I've just made the mistake more times than most, is we project our own principles on other people where we're just like, I don't understand how people would not could not do this and th that's just naive at best and super ignorant um we I, like i try to go the other way which is like I, I try not to assume anything about anybody and i try to assume it sounds terrible but i try to assume the worst that they have zero motivation and one thing that that i think has helped me is like actively seeking out the ability to tee up wins for people even if it's just in conversation where they say well you know i'm trying to think of an example where somebody comes in they say well you know we eat out you know five times a week and i said well are we eating at home the other two and they said yeah we cook at home and we do that and i'm like well great so we, we got two days in the book like let's just try to make it three now so yeah. i think i think like being like and I find myself waiting, like really looking and kind of like waiting, like almost on pins and needles, like what, where's the first win that I can pull from this person in order to make them uh, feel good about this? Um, because I think those people are incredibly delicate and most of them, you have deal with it much more extremes than I do, but most of them are kind of looking for an excuse to not do it. <laughs> uh, I, you know, they. Uh, I'm not sure if it was coach glassman that said this first um or if it just kind of has become part of the lexicon but this tsunami that's heading towards us well from a mental health perspective i definitely agree number one and i want to say um opening up and pivoting our approach as a community towards more of a health oriented mm -hmm. health care provider approach if you will and those are my words, you know, I think that you guys as CrossFit coaches are healthcare providers, not sick care, but healthcare. But I would say the tsunami is a tsunami of ambivalence on the part of this new demographic, because when they're standing with the music pounding out of those speakers and the people are running around, um, I think that, you know, and the energy is fine, the pheromones are flying, you're going to have somebody who's literally at that moment weighing and measuring the pros and cons of whether they want to come back or not. And so knowing how to deal with ambivalence, it's, it's the person who's been there for two years. All right. And they're not all of a sudden they've plateaued, you know, out of their mind on everything. What kind of conversation am I going to have with them? Well, open-ended questions are great. Affirmations are great, but I got to tell you, the R of the acronym OR is, stands for reflective listening. Can you say back to them what you heard them say in your words? If they tell you, hey, I, I was able to cook at home two nights, but we ate out the other five. So how do you find a way to brag on that? Well, you shared that with me. How do you reflect back to them accurately what you think they're really telling you and this is this becomes something where you literally need to practice this and uh, that's one of the things we'll do in the ceu event i mean 
we're going to practice on each other and the more experiential, the better. Yeah. One of the things I've experimented with is, uh, is simply asking them if my interpretation of what they told me, I'm like, so what I'm hearing you say is that you're unhappy with your weight. You know? I love it. And yeah. then I just leave it open and then, and people are like, yes. And then they'll elaborate on it a little bit more. Um, and then, and then you just go from there. But I, there's, and I'd be interested on your thoughts on this. So I think obviously those folks are ambivalent and I think there's, and I'm going to have somebody else on the show who's going to talk a little bit about mental health too, because I do think it's important. Um, but I think there's two conversations to be had here. And I know you probably didn't even plan on this one, but the, the first one is with the client, you know, the client who comes in and there's, and there's probably two buckets of people there. Those people who are in, who are, um, those, uh, those pre-contemplation people. And then those are the people who become, uh, ambivalent or just, they become indifferent, right? Because they're not seeing what they want. And then there's two different conversations you have there. But then the third one I think is on the business owner side of the house. Cause I don't think enough people are talking about the mental health of the entrepreneurs because I think a lot of people are pitching the idea that this is all great and not to say that it's devastating, you know, like it's, it's definitely a super rewarding job, but I don't, I don't think people are being accurate about the stresses that come along with small business ownership. Like, you know, it's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. I will tell you that. Like not everybody crutches it. Like most people probably struggle financially and that has incredible wear on people over time. And then that in turn reflects on you as a person inhibits your ability to have these conversations with other people. Because if, I'm dealing with things internally. It's incredibly difficult for me to have empathy for other people. You have hit the nail on the head. And I believe that uh, people who are just checking boxes off are, they kind of get exposed pretty quickly, the more people that they deal with. So when you're raw and frazzled and you have, as we say in the counseling profession, you have a, uh, compassion fatigue you know yeah uh, it, all you got to do is ask my wife and we could maybe ask yours you know how is it that you can be so nice and helpful to all those clients but you come home and blah 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 so you know what i emptied the tank man and uh there are people who are emptying the tank every day with good intentions Yes, this is the conversation we need to be having with our coaches in our coaches meetings and all this kind of stuff. Guys, are you guys remembering to ask open-ended questions? You know, that's my vision would be, are we using these, you know, state of the science, you know, I got to be careful evidence-based as far as I know, valid and reliable practices, best practices that we use in the behavioral science in our coaching. And with each other. So what would be your advice? So like, what was something that like a business owner like me could do? So, you know, like I, I have no problem saying this, like my wife and I have been to uh, counseling on numerous occasions for different things. You know, we went to counseling after our daughter was born because that was a really traumatic experience. We've been to counseling for just marital issues where, you know, nothing crazy, but like just inability to communicate on things or stress and then having to unpack that and understand that, I'm not actually mad at you. I'm just stressed and I'm not really sure how to deal with that because I don't understand how you're feeling. Um, but that, but what you mentioned there is, is one we, we, I wouldn't say we have it like really frequently, but it's not, we've had the conversation about, you know, you have to be able to, to do, to do both things, right? You have to be able to show care with the, with their clients, but you also have to be able not necessarily empty the tank there so that you can go home and, care about your wife and your kids because you know forget the business like at the end of the day that's all I really got like that's I got my wife and my kids like you know you know hopefully so what like for somebody who's on the verge of that burnout because we did another episode on burnout like what are are there any like tactics or tips or tricks you can do as far as like resetting yourself before you go home to your wife so that you don't like dump all over them because you're frustrated about some crap that happened at the box absolutely first let me say that we are a oral consumptive fixated oriented society when we stress we put things in we human things we eat things we take things orally and the number one way 
to deal with not just stress, but what we would call distress, which is stress, anxiety, um, irrational things, uh, irrational expectations. We also use the same thing, our mouth, we talk. That's how you deal with, that's the natural release valve of pressure for us. And so what I'm gonna suggest to you is, uh, of course, there's a lot of little tactics and strategies. I mean, you know, watch Greg Almondson talk about box breathing. That's helpful. But mm -hmm. you guys already know that you need to exercise and eat right. That helps too. But you're still experiencing stress and anxiety. So we're saying talk about it. And talk about it with someone who exists empathy with you and not going to tell you to just suck it up and pull your bootstraps up and be glad people would crawl on broken glass to be in your position suck it up you know that has caused as much harm as anything yeah that is the just say no of the addiction treatment world you know what we did is we found out uh i'll try to hurry on this no you're good there was a smoke cessation study that was done. It was the state of the art, world class evidence approach to helping people quit smoking. And we offered it for free. It was at the University of Maryland. I say we, the field of counseling and psychology. They offered it for free. Of the people that were offered, 10% took it free. 10% took the opportunity. To so, you know, motivation is an issue. Some people think people lack motivation because they won't quit something. They mm -hmm. won't change something. We see it in the trans theoretical model of change. The stages are pre-contemplation, then contemplation, but then the next one is planning. Most of the time, it's not a motivation issue, it's a planning issue. You don't like motivation, you like planning. Yeah, right? they don't know what to do, right? Like don't that's, yeah, that's, and that's the biggest thing. And that's why most people that, again, fall in this, the, this chronic disease bucket or this, or this, or, or we'll just, we'll just broadly call it the population that we are trying to reach out to. The people that are not fitness enthusiasts, like literally everybody else, it, I, I have, have found that it's, I don't think it's lack of motivation. Yes, there are some people that lack motivation and they will never do anything. And like those people are out, but the rest of them are just at a loss. Like they literally have no plan. They don't know what, they don't know what, you know, how to allocate their time, their money, their resources, the value of exercise, like how to prioritize exercise, how to set their freaking alarm clock. Like it's a behavior thing, which is what we talk about. You know, it's like, uh, fitness, money, and nutrition are all the same. They're all behavior based. Like if you can, if you can wrap your brain around like, what are my behaviors and then figure out how to combat my own behaviors or combat your behaviors, then I think you can have, start to have a, start to have a conversation with people. And that's something that I found super valuable with myself is like, like whether it be money or, or nutrition or fitness or something or whatever, it's just like, okay, what is my current behavior? How is that sabotaging me? And then what can I start to do to create that plan that you talked about to combat those behaviors? Because I'm not going to change it at first. I mean, you, you tell me you're the professional, but like in my experience, I'm never going to change it. I just have to battle with it for a while until I can begin to change it. Hey, planning is so crucial in so many aspects of our lives. Of course, this is not anything new, but I can tell you from a behavioral science standpoint and from my own experience, when I have people come in who are referred by the criminal justice system, which I do a lot of work with legally coerced people, right? So they're not the happiest of campers when they come in and I say, hey man, I'm going to recommend a 13-week program and uh, you're going to have to ask off early from work, and I'm going to put you on a color code drug uh, testing process, and uh, somebody's going to observe you peeing, and all of this kind of stuff. Would you say they're pre-contemplative, contemplative? I don't know until I do an assessment with them and find out and ask them open-ended questions. And I bring this up to say that I can immediately start planning with a person who is even showing signs of ambivalence or even opposition and defiance. I start planning 
with them as early as possible. So I would say to your earlier question that I probably ran a couple of rabbits with, if I'm a gym owner who is frazzled and raw or wore out from doing back to back to back classes and trying to run the gym and have uncomfortable conversations and have accurate empathy, what do you do for them? What can they do? They can sit down at the kitchen table with a low heart rate, okay? Tell all the people that they love that for this one hour, understand I'm okay, but you won't be able to reach me. One hour, I'm gonna invest one hour, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna plan out how I can keep losing my freaking mind at work. And so they do, you showed it the other day, class planning. Well, that's how we gotta plan our day. That's how we plan our business with a plan. And, and the plan includes talking to someone who is unbiased, and look, I'm, I know this is self-promoting, but I believe in the power of sitting with an objective, skilled professional who's not going to judge you, at least not outwardly. They're going to be professional. Um, look, I've got, a, I've got a coach. I've got a mentor, somebody who I go to. Every coach needs a coach, man, as yeah. you know. It's – um. It's something I like my wife and I have worked on like where, where we, we kind of talk these things out and then I recognize. So I, you know, obviously I do this podcast, like, and I, if you're kind of in my inner circle, you, like most people take some little, like I can seem argumentative, meaning like, uh, like I'm quick to have an argument, but for people that know me, it's not because I like to be argumentative for the sake of being argumentative. Uh, I genuinely enjoy um, the, 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 the playing of tennis with ideas. It's just like, I'm going to say something. And then I really enjoy you coming back with a counter offer. And then we go back there with, in many instances with no desire to win simply to just play the game of batting ideas and conversation back. And, but that can, but that drives my wife insane. Like she doesn't want to do that. So, um, so we defined it as I like what is described as mental jousting, like, because I just find it stimulating. Um, so when I get into that state, like I now recognize it and I'll have to stop myself and I say, Hey, listen, I'm, I'm not jousting with you right now. I genuinely need to know this information. Yes. Right? And it, and it, and it really heads off some things where, where, where she would just like spin off and like, you know, kick me in the shin or something like that. Um, so I think if you can figure out like from a coaching standpoint, if you know that like you're strung up or you're strung out by the end of the day. It's like recognize that. Like I think simply recognizing that and maybe sitting in your car for five minutes before you go home or maybe, you know, isolating yourself 10 to 15 minutes before you do a sit down with a client who you know is coming in here that might be challenging to work with. Like get your mind right. Like it, that, that works. Um, but I did have another question in here. And so we're talking a lot about, you know, using these tactics and, and, and doing this. And I know there's somebody who's listening to this and, and, and is just like kind of throwing their hands up and saying, Hey, listen, where does being direct fall in here? Like at what point just be like, listen, you're overweight or you eat like crap or you skip training days. Like, I don't know how else to tell you this and no amount of me open asking you open into questions is going to get us where we need to be. Like at some point I feel like you need to tell you that you suck, you know? Where, like where does that fall in from a coaching standpoint? Absolutely. Such a fair question. A okay. it's, let me say this. My own personal opinion is there's a time and a place for being assertive in this way. Not aggressive, but assertive. Right? So instead of saying you're obese, that's why you can't link you know, five chest to bar. You're throwing your belt down and storming out four classes up. Um, what, what's wrong with saying, man, what's going on? Open ended question. Dude, you were totally intense in that workout. It looked like you're having a great workout. And then shut up and listen to them. And then, if they show you that they're in action mode, you know, pre-contemplation, 
contemplation, preparation, action. If they tell you by how they answer the open-ended question, the things you need to hear to discern whether they're in this or that state, then you know, hey, they just opened the door for me. Look, you're going to lose 30 pounds, man. Would you like to work on a way to do that? Yeah, I think that's super important because I think some people, and I've admittedly, I've been there as my, I just like, just get frustrated. And I'm like, you are not, you're just delusional about whatever it is. And I've been delusional by myself. I'm not perfect by any means, but you know, like there's certain times when I wish somebody would have come in direct and said, Hey, listen, this isn't the time for me to be huggy on you. Like I'm going to, I'm going to give you the tough love that you need. Now, granted, like I respond well to that but not everybody does. Right. So it, it, I've, I've been in an instance where I project my own responses onto other people and it's, and it's not worked, you know, so sometimes you do have to be a little bit more soft with people um, about how you address them. But no, I do think so, a tactic that I've learned to use, and I, I don't remember where I learned this. I think, I think I talk about Chick-fil-A a lot just because I think they do a lot of things well. And one of our members here is, uh, is uh, operates two um, restaurants, but their thing is never assume you know what kind of day the person at the at the window is having. And I think if we operate under the guise of like, hey, this person could very well be having a terrible day, I think inherently we just approach things differently. Like I'm not going to assume that you're ready to joke around today um, or or stuff like that. So I think it's like you kind of like, test the waters real quick and then, okay, you're good or you're not. And then I ask, Hey, like, are you okay? Like what's up? And that's something that I've learned probably only gotten good at within the last couple of years is when I see somebody's off, that's the first thing I ask them. Like, are you all right? Like, is there any, something going on? You want to sit down and talk about it? And, um, I mean, dude, you would be shocked at some of the shit that people have told me, you know, like this, this is interesting because like coaches are not counselors, but we're kind of counselors. Hey, let me say this. Uh, I want to piggyback off of that. Do you know uh, Dr. Kevin Elko? Are you familiar with him? I'm not. Yeah, he's like uh, Nick Saban's, uh, you know, uh, mental performance guru guy that he goes to. He comes and speaks to different – goes and speaks to sports teams and okay. big corporations and stuff. But anyway, Dr. Elko said something. He and I were trained by uh, – a guy named Dr. Ed Jacobs in cognitive behavioral psychology. But uh, anyway, Dr. Elko said, if every person you met, if you just assumed and presupposed on every single person you meet after our conversation, that every one of them's hurting, they're hurting, experiencing emotional pain, how what would your body language be like like how do you look at your friend when they say their parent just passed away what is and so how would you talk or how much would you listen how much self-control would you have how would you approach that he said so the funny thing is is that you would be right it's actually true that all people are struggling with something uh, this is not a pessimistic point of view this is a highly emotionally intelligent way i think not just me but in general for people to view uh human beings everybody's got something going on i love your approach where you test the water and here's one thing that a coach actually taught me a football coach years ago he said look the first day he actually brought the parents out just like middle school football but he did the smartest thing, I, I think, still to this day. And I use this the first time I meet clients. How would you like for me to handle you not following my directions? How would you like me to approach? In essence, how do you like to be coached? Yeah. Now, it, could, it could change. But that, in a way, what you do if I can get on your tail without having to beat around the bush a lot. Yeah. And that's what kind of, that's what kind of athlete I was, which means I had a lot of work to do in the coaching realm. Cause I was just, listen, give me both barrels. Like you can yell at me all day, like hold me underwater forever. Like it doesn't matter. Like it just, that's where I, that's generally how I responded. Well, um, one thing that I've learned to do, and this, this is going to sound incredibly mundane and just not important at all, but 
a very simple question that if you just ask people when they come in the gym, will probably give you more information than, than you could possibly imagine is I just give them a high five and I say, how you feeling? And their response to that based on their body language, their facial expressions and the words that they use gives me a pretty accurate idea of what I'm dealing with that day. How you feeling? And they'll be like, ah, oh, you know, they'll do that one. Or they're like, man, I feel great. I've had a good week. And I'm like, okay, cool. Or, you know, they're just like, I don't know. It's been a rough week. Like they will tell you. And I, and, and then I can open, follow up with some other questions after that. But it gives me an idea of like, is this person going to shit the bed in the workout today? And if they do now, what am I going to do about it? Like where normally I would get on this person, but today I'm going to cut them some slack and walk over and just say, Hey, just take it easy. Just move today. I know you're having a rough day. Don't care what the time says. Just finish it. and We'll be done. You know, but I think that that simple question of how you feeling has, has been like super beneficial for me because, and the responses are not lengthy by any means. Like, but, the body language, the facial expressions, and the words they use generally give me, I would tell you, like 80 to 90% accuracy of like what I'm going to be dealing with that day in the class. And, uh, and I don't think we ask enough questions. We just assume everybody's there and ready, to, and ready to throw down. And some people are there just to, you know, literally get a break from the craziness and disaster that is their life. You guys say the best hour of their day. Absolutely. Yeah. I love the question how are you feeling is an open-ended question. It's awesome. And it, and it goes a lot of different ways, right? So it's like, how are you feeling physically? How are you feeling emotionally? How are you feeling psychologically? And most people's answer is going to go to the one, whichever one of those three that they're currently dealing with. So like just by default, they're going to give you the, the most important piece of information that they're currently feeling at that point. And uh, I think it's a really, really important one. And, uh, so I just ask people that all the time. Just how are you feeling? And I like, I mean, it is like dead every single time, dead on. I'm just like, okay, all right. I'm just gonna leave you alone today. Or, or if you're ready to go, I'm gonna be all over you today. So I, I think that's where it comes in is like this, this ability to be a coach and meet people where they're at. Yeah. I don't think you can. I don't think you can just meet people where they're at. I think you have to know where they're at first, and then you can work on meeting them where they're at. So um, this is very cool. Um, okay. So the, the, the CEU like for everybody that missed that, there's a course on there for your level two, level three, or actually for your level three. And then eventually for your level four, uh, which I believe is supposed to be online in 2020, but different subject, um, ORS, the art of science of uncomfortable conversation and ORS, the acronym stands for open ended questions, affirmation, reflective listening. And then what was the S format? The S is summarizing. This is really where we are what what it is we're agreeing on as a partnership, not a dictatorship, even though they know you're in a position of authority, the more yeah. we can be in a, in a kind of relationship with them that is uh, a cohort more than a dictator. But the summary is really taking everything that you heard from them, everything you're experiencing, and then having that plan we talked about. Where do we go from here? So what, now what, as we say. And then the other piece of that was, so you have your, your folks that are pre-contemplation, you have your, um, contemplation, contemplation, your action folks, and then your planning, right? So the vast majority of people that we deal with are probably in contemplation or, or action, actually even more so probably in action for a CrossFit gym. So where we need to develop some skill sets is that kind of pre-contemplation, contemplation lane. And then this is where we can start to use that or so in order to meet people where they're at so that we can get them on board because these are the people that need us the most, right? Like the people that are near a gym, like you're just giving them more of what they already have, you know, and at some point we have to decide like, Hey, a really broad population of out there of, of people out there that are dealing with the, the tsunami of chronic disease or ambivalent or ambivalence, like you said. And uh, how do we start to communicate with those people uh, and it starts with a plan, no different than your lesson plan. You know, if you're trying to bring in more and more people, like what is your plan for talking to people who are, we'll just call it what it is, unlikely to purchase your service. Yes. You absolutely. Know? So, you know, um, Fern, I know we're probably getting close to wrapping up, but I got to throw this out here. If I've got, yeah, go ahead. In the addiction treatment world, and I would say in around the late eighties, early nineties, when I started getting into this field, uh, we really, uh, as a treatment community, we were still doing what's called confrontation. We still, 
saw that as a therapeutic technique. We would, we would confront people in group therapy about relapse, about acting in ways that are going to lead to relapse, about acting in ways that create triggers that will lead to relapse and all that stuff. And, and we also viewed people who didn't follow our directions as people who are not ready. And we would judge them and we would say, now, this hasn't been that long ago. Have you ever heard this? The person just hasn't hit rock bottom yet. Yep. This was wrong. Mm -hmm. A person doesn't have to lose everything to be prepared, to be motivated to change. And so what we learned is finding out where they are relative to their perception of their problem. Where are they? Are they already in contemplation and they're just waiting for the person, the right person to have accurate empathy with them to say, Hey man, I can see where you're weighing the pros and cons here and the devil, you know, is better than the one you don't know. So not making a decision is safe to you. Right. And yeah. so we, to just say, hey, we'll wait on them, and we waited around till jail, institutionalization, or death, which is the three outcomes of people who continue uh, at least taking abusing substances. So I don't want us to be that way when this tsunami of ambivalence walks through our doors as we continue to promote treating and helping uh, this new population. Uh, Thank you so much for letting me do this with you. Yeah, absolutely. This is fun. And I think, I think it is important because I think as we start to, you know, cast that larger net for people, I do think what we're going to find is that a lot of us are woefully ill-equipped to start to deal with that converse, that, that population, but that doesn't mean we can't develop those skills. And, um, and a lot of what we're going to be difficult, we're dealing with as we start to wade into those waters is very similar, if not the exact same as addiction, because most of these people are dealing with what's just food addiction. You know what I mean? So it's not like it's, it's the same, you know, like we still have to approach this from a, almost from a, from, from a clinical standpoint, not, not as clinicians, but from a, from a strategic standpoint, you know, um, because that stuff has been proven to work and there's some really cool stuff out there. Um, is there, so we talked about the uh, couple of books. So there was motivational interviewing, but is there anything else that you would recommend for like coaches, gym owners that can, uh, they can really deep dive on this stuff so that they can start to sharpen that sharpen the ax on like how to start to have these conversations. Yeah. What I'm going to recommend to you guys is to do your own study on motivational interviewing, anything by uh, Dr. Miller, or Rollinick, R-O-L-L-I-N-I-C-K. So Miller and Rollinick are the, the authorities on motivational interviewing as a counseling style to help people deal with things like ambivalence or being stuck in one of these stages of change. Yeah. Uh, and then Prochaska, I believe it's is the name of the guy and University of Maryland who did a lot of the work on the trans theoretical model of change. I think it'll make you much more competent. Uh, you're already competent in so much that's helping, you know, me folks. If you're a CrossFit coach around the world, you're already doing amazing things. I think this is just another tool uh, for me because, you know, as they say, if all you ever see are nails, all you ever use is a hammer. hammer. I, I view all of this stuff as a mental health issue, all of it. I see that, you know, I, I, part of the treatment plan for some of my clients is you need to find a CrossFit box. And, yeah. and I do that. It's yeah. not the only answer, but it is one of the tools. And I think that's key is that it's not the only answer and we just can't fix things with exercise. Like there's, there's a lot more that goes into that. Yes. That exercise can help with depression and it can, it can be an avenue for some people, but it's not going to solve people's problems. Like, you know, coming in and doing burpees and thrusters is not the answer to, you know, mental health. Um, it, it's definitely a tool. It's one of many tools we have in our tool bag in order to address that, but it's not the only thing. Um, the other thing I had in here, I found it well is uh, coactive coaching. So if anybody's interested in coactive coaching, it, it's, it's very, it's like, it falls in that Stephen Covey, 
kind of like genre of books um, and, and some really good stuff in there. But it's very long. It's very much it's very similar to um, uh, motivational interviewing. It's a lot of open ended questions about like trying to get people to give you information um, with regard to like what they're feeling and stuff like that. So, um, dude, this has been fun. I think this is super valuable for the community, particularly as we start to really try to right try to serve the underserved population you know which is primarily like the chronically ill um because i think these skill sets are what we're all going to have to develop you know but these are these are things that are useful with just your everyday relationships as well so it's not like this is just for you know clients so this is cool yeah awesome i appreciate you guys are, are you familiar with victor frankel yep yeah yeah with uh um man's search for meaning yep yeah in that book, he says, and I, I just, you know, this helps me, as you said earlier, you got to find a way to get your mind right. Some, you know, Victor Frankel, who I guess we could safely say experienced some trauma and some discomfort in his life. That would um, be an understatement. Yeah. Dr. Frankel says somewhere in there, and I'm paraphrasing, but I highly recommend the book to everyone. Man, yeah, it's, a, so it's a short, yeah, it's a short read too. It's not a big book read somewhere in there buried like a you know like a treasure uh he says he says success must not be pursued it must ensue as an unintended byproduct of one's dedication to someone other than themselves and this is really selfless in many ways we do leave our best days our best moments uh, in the in the counseling office and in, in my experience on the gym floor and yours um, maybe all across the country for you as you train people some of our best moments are used in places other than with our family and friends and loved ones but remembering that that's what this is about we chose it right yeah this is what we chose and maybe it chose us yeah no, I think it's cool. And I think uh, Cassidy brought it up in a, in a previous episode, which is one way to measure that is to kind of keep your, constantly keep yourself on the hook and be like, are people better for having been in my presence? And um, that's a pretty, that's a pretty heavy burden to bear if you think about it. Um, but that's, that's what you signed up for if you do this. So Matt, I appreciate this, man. This was, uh, this was fun for me. So I, I, I can't thank you enough for this. Um, if you guys have questions for Matt, he owns, um, uh, it's Matt Miller coaching, correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, Matt Miller coaching. But if you have other questions about, you know, some of the, some of the more nerdy stuff that, that we were talking about, please hit us up. We can hand you off to Matt, but look him up. Um, and, uh, and we will get you guys in touch, but thank you again, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. Improving your life or achieving your goals can sometimes feel like climbing a mountain. On the Tiny Leaps Big Changes podcast, host Greg Clunas gives practical tips and advice to help you build momentum towards accomplishing the seemingly impossible. Each episode provides research-based strategies or firsthand experiences on topics like mental health, fitness, nutrition, finances, career, and relationships. You can listen to the Tiny Leaps Big Changes podcast on Spotify or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast. Thanks for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. First of all, it's free. How cool is that? There's a creation tool that allows you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer, so it becomes super simple. Some of these episodes with Fern or Todd or myself chatting with one another, we've done right within the app itself. Anchor will make it easy to distribute your podcast to all platforms, Spotify, Apple, and many more. And you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make an awesome podcast in one place. All you have to do is download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started today. Thanks again for listening to Best Hour of Their Day. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, one more time, please leave us a review on Apple Podcast and send us any feedback you have to at Best Hour of Their Day on Instagram and Best Hour of Their Day at gmail.com if you want to shoot us an email. 
We appreciate you. Thanks again. Have a great rest of your day.